Hello everybody, this is rewriting history and I have brought my protege possible history. <laughs> In this one hour podcast setting, we will answer as many questions possible regarding World War 3, alternate history and if you have time we'll touch on the European Union. So, my first question, dear possible history. One time if you remember, I was on the train and we were talking. And I had this video that you said you disagreed with one of my points. Two creators, two different creators, as close to realistic scenarios. And I said that my point of view is that if two creators do this, what would happen is that the scenarios would be very similar. Like the scripts would be set in a different way, the visuals would be different, but basically the same things would happen. And you said that you disagreed with this one. And I'm yeah. very curious as to why. Yeah, obviously, uh, it depends a lot of the, on the scenario itself. Um, and there are some scenarios where that will be the case. But basically, what you're assuming is that beyond us being 100% realistic, we also have 100% of the information available, which is almost never the case. Like, I try to be as realistic as possible in my videos. And then someone in the comments will be like, okay, uh, great take, but you forgot this minor point that I didn't find during the research, which changes the scenario around. So that's one piece of the puzzle. Like, unless both of us have the exact same information, which also coincidentally is all the information available, we already wouldn't get the same scenario necessarily. But then I like even... Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but then even more importantly, perhaps, is like, let's say, let's call it ideology or like historical paradigm. Like the very way we look at history will change um, the scenario we come up with. Uh, for example, I have a communist uh, friend uh, who I very much like to debate. His opinion about Trotsky and how he would perform as the leader of the Soviet Union is totally different from mine. But both of us have very defendable positions about why our version would be correct. I still think I am more correct than he is, but we are both just basing our scenario on our assumption of what Trotsky would be like, which can still be a realistic presumption if you explain where it comes from. But we would still have two completely different scenarios. I can also add to that, before we started recording, we were discussing Bulgaria and how the Great Wall of China was built because of the Bulgarians, obviously. And the thing is that I said that if the Mongol Empire, for example, didn't exist or didn't rise or whatever, that Bulgaria would be stuck in Ukraine and Donbass region. And possible history immediately laughed and was like, okay, so you're going to take something major like the Mongol Empire not existing, like China still existing and stuff like that. And the first thing you'll do is discuss Bulgaria. But that's obvious to me because I'm Bulgarian. So there is like some bias, for example. So I think that this just adds to the story, like a different perspective. Exactly. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful point on how even 100% realistic videos, uh, even if all of us made only 100% realistic vi videos, we wouldn't make the same video because we would have different focuses. And I know you don't study history, uh, I do. Um, and even within historical research, and we're all researching the same history, we have different perspective, you have economic, you have top-down, you have bottom-up, whatever. So just by the fact that we would focus on different aspects, we would get different videos, I, I would talk about the broader aspects of no Mongol Empire, and you would make an interesting video on specifically uh, what would happen to Bulgaria, for example, and it would still be, uh, it would still all be unique, or at least it very much could be. This leads me to two questions that I have. One is about ideology that people sprinkle in their videos, which I have been fairly accused of in my short career i assume that you have suffered this plenty but a, i don't Pentagon see it paid soviet simp uh but it's so different it's... pakistani nationalist i believe of course and if somebody said okay you're a bulgarian nationalist right now i'm making a video where the ottoman empire doesn't does never collapse 
and Bulgaria completely gets screwed. And I'm like, okay, I see how I can get framed as a Bulgarian nationalist since sometimes I make Bulgaria big. But the times that I make Bulgaria big is when the central powers win, for example. Like, how am I not going to make them big? And I have been accused of ideology, but it's not like somebody will say, you're ultra-nationalist, you're communist, you're the too liberal, you're too something. And I'm like, but this is not one thing. Like, I don't get it. And what's your take on this? I th- especially, I'm sorry for cutting you off, especially if, do you think that other people are adding ideology on purpose? Because I have also been accused of this. Somebody is like, okay, you're a communist and you're making pro-communist videos just because. And I don't get it. So please give me your take. Uh, I think in terms of the nations, you have it particularly hard with Bulgaria because the Dutch in history, there are a couple of periods where they're relevant, but really I just don't mention them. They aren't involved in the major wars too much and whatever, you know. But Bulgaria in history has been on the losing side of so many conflicts that basically any change you make to Bulgarian history will result in a bigger Bulgaria, which considering the knowledge that you're Bulgarian, can bring up that idea in people's minds. Um, Beyond that, though, personally, I'm not... uh, Ideology in videos, I think it's mostly what people want to see in them, you know? Uh, Especially on the Soviet Union in World War II, I am quite positive on the Soviet... (laughs) I'm not positive on the Soviet Union... I am positive on the Soviet Union's uh, war capabilities against the Germans. Um, And because of that, I've often been criticized for being a communist. But at the same time, I've been criticized for always letting America defeat the Soviets during Cold War scenarios and such. So, really, anyone can read any ideology in any video that they want. And there are videos which do have strong ideology bias in them. But I think for the most part, it's people reading too much into something that isn't there. And what about realistic scenarios, if I can touch on that? Because some of my videos, people will say, okay, that's not realistic. And I'm like, okay, if I do it in a realistic way, then nothing too interesting would happen. And we get paid by how many people watch until the end of the video or close to the end. Like, that's the goal. And if I make a super boring video, but it's super realistic, then like 10 people would enjoy it. And it's like a sacrifice that we need to make. I am willing to sacrifice a bit of realism just so I can get an entertaining scenario. Like some of my videos, I just disclaim, or it's not realistic. Yeah, I I think that's the most important part. Personally, uh, I've released a number of videos. Uh, I think the most, the one most people keep referencing is the... I made a video on Russia winning the Crimean War. And my conclusion was basically, there there would be things different, but some people claim like the entire balance of power would be broken, Constantinople falls, the Balkans would be liberated. And that's just not the balance of power at that time. Nobody would allow Russia to do that realistically. So I made a video, which was like 15 minutes long probably. And the conclusion was basically not that much changed. Personally, I don't really mind too much. Um, But to spice up those videos, I often go like, okay, so this was the realistic portion. If if I'm being realistic, I don't think too much would change. But now let's go into a more exciting view, you know? Let's now wonder what if Russia actually did conquer all of this stuff. Uh, For example, I have a video on a French victory during the seven years war coming up and the main timeline my conclusion would be like a french victory would change a lot but would be very underwhelming because actually defeating the british navy and doing crazy stuff isn't really that realistic but i would still first cover the realistic version and then say but what if france did just completely crush the British navy and win decisively everywhere you know i think As long as you disclaim and explain the changes you make to make it unrealistic, I think there should be no problem between the two. I agree, and I actually stopped receiving these complaints after I gave the people the realistic answer that they were looking for. 
but I have seen that if I do something a bit unrealistic, it would result in such a cool scenario. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it anyways. So if you have seen recently, over half of my videos in the past two months, I just offer two endings, not just one. I always split my scenarios up. And I also, yeah. I think that in general, it makes a lot of sense uh, to, when you're making alternate history, to give multiple endings. Uh, because the first point of departure will lead to a couple of changes. From there, we, we're basically just guessing. And to, except for like a couple of scenarios, it is basically impossible to definitively say, this is what definitely would have happened. So even in small ways, I'm always like, okay, so they would get this, but maybe they wouldn't, uh, maybe they get more, et cetera, et cetera. Always offer like a pool of changes instead of just, this is it, this is the timeline now. If I can also add something to that, I think that you'll find it very enjoyable since both of you write, both of us write our own scripts. And I was like, okay, we need a good story arc. So basically you need a good underdog story, which I mean, Rocky in the first movie, just coming as close as he did is very unrealistic. I think that we all can agree, but man, what a story. Okay. I'm, I'm shook, man. <laughs> Rocky was a national treasure. He deserved the title. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what I mean? So basically you need a good underdog story and you can't achieve this in a realistic way. I mean, it's fiction. I mean, personally, uh, I definitely lean more towards the realistic side of alternate history. Uh, I, I don't really worry about, does this make a good scenario? Does this not make a good scenario? I, I, I just look at what I think would happen and I don't really consider like, okay, but this isn't a good story. This would be a good story. This is funnier. This is, uh, uh, it, it doesn't interest me as much unless I'm writing fully unrealistic scenarios, which I have done a couple of times, but it interests me far. All right, let me go to this question. What are the main problems in the alternate history community? Like, what do you think? Is it something that we discussed or do you have something more to ask that to add to this topic? Uh, personally, I, I wouldn't really know. Uh, I used to watch alternate history in high school. I have basically stopped afterwards. Um, the only channels I watch now are Alternate History Hub um, and sometimes videos of um, the people I like to collaborate with. Uh, so I watch your videos occasionally, but I just don't really watch that much Alternate History anymore. So to really speak of problems in the community, I, I, I don't, I don't know anything basically. But you do get people who watch your videos and they will say, okay, that's not realistic. That's ideology. That's something. So you can also discuss your problems, not just the whole community as a whole. Yeah. The thing is on the, on the whole, I, I, I think the community is quite fine. Um, of course you get the people who are like, oh, you're being uh, biased. You're being unrealistic, but I don't see that as too much of an issue especially the realistic ones, uh, assuming that they actually provide good arguments, that's great. Like, I don't know everything. I make mistakes in my videos and I like getting called out of them on them if people actually support them. Of course, if people only say like, hey, you're being a knob, this is completely bullshit. Like, that, that's not great, but you get that everywhere. So I'm not really too bothered by those kinds of people. Uh, I just ignore them. I don't really read too many comments anymore anyways. So, uh, honestly, for me, reading negative comments just makes me immune to all the hate because like people will tell me, I can't understand the word you're saying because of your accent. And I'm like, okay, this is the 10th time I have heard this today. And I'm like, okay, I need to improve my accent. Yes. But am I really going to let that bother me? Oh no. Like it's a, I have walked a very long road. I think that even yesterday I watched one of my old videos and I was like, oh man, thank God I have improved. And imagine like after six months, how it would yeah. sound. So yeah, of course. Yeah, watching my old videos is always, uh, always a struggle. 
just <laughs> hearing my voice, hearing the way I speak even, because I think it was one time I watched a video of um, Alpharet, I assume you know him. Uh -huh. um, he was criticizing, or criticizing, he was talking to another YouTuber, uh, Pokemon Challenges, on his way of presenting. And he said, you should um, sit, sit relatively straight and speak with some enthusiasm. In, and use your outside voice, he called it, instead of your inside voice. And I heard that, and that really clicked and stuck with me. Uh, and that improved my speaking so much, because right now I'm mostly using my outside voice. But like when I'm talking to my friends, I lean back, and I find it I find it's difficult to even attempt to do it now on camera. But because we are not friends. Yes, exposed. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, there I go. But like the enthusiasm level and the way you speak, um, the amount of energy you put in your speech changes so much. Uh, so hearing back to my old videos where I was just very, in a very monotone way, speaking with a low volume with a lot of gaps between my speaking, uh, it it shows how much how far I've come, basically. And this is something that people don't usually get, that two guys from Europe would have problems speaking in front of a microphone. And they're like, okay, what's a big deal? But it's actually quite a big deal. And for me, when I'm recording, because I'm from Bulgaria, and we have, use a completely different writing script, Reading English is sometimes hard, and pronouncing in English is sometimes even harder. And doing the two things at once, you can assume how much time it takes to just record a voiceover on a script. But when I'm speaking freely like that, I can just feel my accent is a lot better. I don't make any grammatical mistakes or any mistakes at all. It's just the accent. So yeah, it's quite difficult. What about the main benefits of the alternative history community, since we couldn't say a lot about the negatives? Yeah, it depends a bit on what you mean with the alternate history community. Do you mean like the viewers or the creators or? I guess we can touch on both. Um, well, I think mainly everyone is very open in the alternate history community in terms of the viewers. I think they are very welcome to new voices, to new channels. Uh, there is a lot of space between like the 100% realistic kind of alternate histories and the more story-based types of alternate histories. So it really is a very broad collection of people, a broad collection of channels, which I think is always great, um, offering basically anyone who wants anything something great you know for example i think videntis with his visual storytelling uh his videos usually look amazing uh he goes for the more the bolder the story based alternate histories i th i think that that's awesome you know and on the other hand you have uh, alternate history hub who focuses basically fully on realism uh and everything in between i think that is the main the best part about our community right now. Do you think that the alternate history is in general an underserved niche? Um, how do you mean? Like we, that we wouldn't have enough creators? Yeah, basically. Um, I, I don't really have an opinion on that too much. I remember when I was young and actually watched it, there were channels enough. Um, we had like Muncher Z, What If Alt Hist, Alt History Hub, uh, and a couple of smaller ones, which I think was more than enough. You now have like Muncher Z and What If Alt Hist moving away from Alt History, and you see that channels like mine and yours are coming in to fill the void. So I think it's, I th don't think that's necessarily an issue. Uh, and new channels will pop up if old ones start moving to more serious politics content, uh, geopolitics, etc., etc. I don't think there's any issue, issue with over- or under-saturation, really. 
I'm not pointing out as an issue because I can see from my experience starting relatively recently, it's like 10 months, I think. Yeah, it's almost exactly 10 months, actually. And it did seem quite an, as an underserved niche because I told people on my YouTube community what they prefer. Do I give an updated take on old scenarios like what if Germany won World War II? Because there are some videos, but there are usually a couple of years old. And I was like, okay, I can update them. Or do I make scenarios that are never seen before? On top of my head, uh, what if Napoleon III puppeted Mexico in this like war that he had with Maximilian I, the Austrian emperor going to the throne? And nobody has ever done that scenario. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna make it. And it saw some success. And there is just so many scenarios in the alternate history community that will probably never see the light of day because there is only so much a couple of creators can do. So I think that if new people start joining and start making videos, they would see good success, I feel like. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. But uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily an issue in terms of the scenarios that are uncovered. And you're never going to cover everything, especially when creators are creative in their scenarios beyond just like, what if the other side won this war? You can change so many things in history is really a bottomless pit. We're never going to run out of scenarios, especially since I, we discussed it at the, at the beginning, I can cover scenarios that other people have already covered in a different way. So uh, if you try to quantify, it, quantify over and under saturation by the amount of scenarios out there, you're never going to reach a point where we're satisfied. So there's always room for more people in the Alden history creator community uh, in that regard. And also, I think that the community is very accepting and very welcoming because I can come as a Bulgarian who doesn't speak English very well and I can see and, and, and I can still see some support. This was especially difficult to pronounce. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've uh, basically never had a video that was overly disliked, even. Uh, when I myself look back on it and I'm, and I'm like, okay, uh, that wasn't my best take. Uh, I would definitely do that different now. I think people are very constructive, very kind to creators. So uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I also can add something very interesting because due to TikTok, YouTube shorts and all that, the people's attention span is ruined, but kind of not in the history community. Because you can imagine that for a lot of other genres, and niches and everything, the viewer attention has to be going down. But in history niche, you don't have that. You don't have history shorts or anything remotely close, which is only a positive for the niche. Yeah, we, we do. But I think for the most part, like the viewers as well as the creators, it's really a struggle. Like, you want to, I want to get as much information as possible across, but also I have to worry about YouTube algorithms, I have to worry about attention spans. But I think in the history community, the wonderful thing is people are watching our videos to learn to a certain extent. Um, even if I would say, uh, in general, we're more entertainers than we are educators, people still want to learn, they want more information, they want the longer videos, which... Uh, is a unique thing in the history and educational sphere of YouTube, which I really appreciate. So basically to sum it all up, if you want to start doing this, which is my next question, if you want to start doing YouTube and especially alternate history, I think that you can very easily see some success to keep you going. You can upload five videos, one might take off and by take off, I mean 500 views, which for a new creator, that's more than enough. And since everybody's so welcoming, it doesn't matter your accent, your background, your nothing really matters. You don't have to use your own maps. Mine and possible history maps are made available for free and they're quite good. So you can use any of them. You have a lot of resources. You just need to write a script and record your voice. So if you decide not to do it, it's like all on you because I could have easily said, I don't have any maps. I don't speak English properly. I have never written a script in my life, but here I am. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's if you uh, are passionate about doing this, the most important thing is to just start. I when I began, I had literally zero skills in anything related to video making. I still don't, but it's better now. Uh, the only way to learn these kinds of things, unless you have like a friend who really knows everything, is to just start, just do it. I've deleted all of my old videos because they're garbage, but they still brought me to where I am now, you know? So, absolutely agree. Especially with the way YouTube is now, is they are really, they're really getting good at pushing smaller creators. Sometimes that's really annoying because you'll scroll YouTube and you'll get a random suggestion of like uh, a Let's Play channel with 50 views. And you're like, okay, YouTube, did I really need to see this? But on the whole, it's a very good thing because it means that smaller channels don't get buried in the algorithm. So in terms of the YouTube algorithm, I think this is among the best moments to start a new channel and see where it goes. I can add something that I think that you would absolutely love. It's from, I don't know how to call him, Alex Kormozi. He's a businessman, has a YouTube channel with 2 million subscribers, has a company doing 200 million in revenue and all that. And he's just sharing his thoughts on YouTube. And actually on my Discord server, I have a Twitter channel where basically I write stuff that I either learn today or whatever. And this one that he said stuck with me and you absolutely love it since it has, it just basically summarizes everything that we said. And it's like, it takes 20 hours for anyone to become proficient or something. So basically in 20 hours, if you're playing a guitar, you know what you don't know and you already know where to find it. So you're, you have potential to grow basically. Yeah. And the problem with people is that they take 10 years to start their first hour. And basically, starting tomorrow doesn't benefit you in any way. And if you start today, the only regret that you could have had is that you didn't start earlier. Because especially in YouTube, if you start earlier, like imagine, because I started quite late. I had this idea of starting for like three months, but my justification for not doing it was the most stupid reason is because I wanted to feature a coin in a video that has now 2000 views, so nobody pretty much cares. And I was like, okay, I need to get this coin, but I need to pay delivery. But this guy lives like 10 kilometers from me, seven miles. I can go or something like that. And I just delayed the creation of my channel because of a stupid coin. <laughs> you haven't told that story before, but that's crazy, man. <laughs> And you know what? I didn't get it. So I was like, okay, okay. And while I was waiting for this coin to arrive, I made two new videos, not to arrive, just while I was contemplating getting it in my head. I made entire two videos. So basically I debuted YouTube with three videos uploaded all at once, all referring back to each other, which I don't recommend the strategy. It wasn't worth it, but I did it anyways. Yeah, fair enough. To smaller channels, uh, I would recommend just putting your scenarios out there on things like Reddit and stuff. Uh, you, you won't get that many views, but it does have the possibility to really start the train rolling. Uh, just a couple of outside views uh, on your first video, so that your first video isn't just sitting there at zero views, can be amazing. Uh, I, I think that uh, that's what I did for like the first couple of months. I posted all of my scenarios on Reddit just in hopes of getting more viewership from there. The more situation here and actually I got on my video that I like my fourth ever video. I just decided to put it on Reddit and it got like 2000 or 3000 impressions, which is quite good. I would say like it's, it's free. You can just take advantage of it. And then obviously I stopped since I yeah. started yeah. getting more views. Exactly. At some point, it's no longer worth the effort. You can still do it, but uh, it, there's no, there's really no need to. And uh, I noticed because I was releasing quite a lot, people were getting annoyed on Reddit, which wasn't a big issue. But I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna stop. It's okay now. 
But it's a definite good way to get the ball rolling, or at least see where it leads. I think that we have already answered the question of how to start a YouTube channel, alternate history YouTube channel to be more specific. The answer is just do it because you'll regret not doing it earlier if this is truly what you want to do. Yeah, if, if it's something you want to do, don't don't feel like you have to be a YouTuber because you yeah, of course. don't. But is it worth it? What is your opinion? To, to start a channel or to be a YouTuber? What's the difference? Um, you can start a channel for any type of reasons. Like, I didn't start a channel in hopes of becoming a YouTuber. Um, so I would yeah, definitely I separate having a hobby channel and having mm -hmm. a, I wouldn't say professional channel, but like, I'm doing this as a career type of thing. Yes, yeah, same here. I think that most people would be interested in the career side of things, because if it's a hobby, then they just don't care about views. They mostly do it for themselves. Uh, fair, but there are still plenty of people who are like, I'm just going to chuck a couple of videos out there uh, and, and that's it for me. Uh, even if they are wildly successful, I've seen many big channels with great content just quit because YouTubing wasn't for them, uh, which I very much understand. Oh, I think we have time to discuss both, both so we can do it. What about the hobby side of things? Is it worth it? Uh, I think in terms of the hobby sides of things, it's always worth it. Uh, if it is there anything more fun than just talking about something you're passionate about uh, to your friends, to whatever, that is basically what you get to do on YouTube, especially as a hobby. If you don't care too much about the amount of views you get, it's amazing to just be able to vent out, like, this is what I watched and it was awesome. Uh, I read a history book. It was awesome. Like, it can be, a, if it's something you're comfortable with, because obviously you are putting yourself out there in a way, I think it is an amazing thing to be able to do that in the modern day. Basically, what I can add to this is that you're still developing skills, which means that if you edit your own videos, you can sort of apply as a video editor and you had your own YouTube channel, which I think is better in some ways than just having some degree that you got online and you paid $50 for it or whatever. So basically it boosts quite a lot. Yeah, I think yeah. the most important general skill that anyone will be able to improve on by YouTubing is just speaking and public speaking. Like the fear that I once had speaking in front of a classroom like, that's basically gone. If if I can speak for a uh, hundred random people online, I can also speak in front of a classroom. It's a bit different because the people are there in person, which makes it still a little bit more nerve-wracking, but it's it, it has definitely become way easier and way more natural when I'm actually up there. And what about the career side of things of doing YouTube? Uh, that would very much depend on the types of person. Like, I've mentioned a lot of people quitting. Like, the mental part of YouTube, I would say, uh, can definitely be devastating. Uh, and, like, on the viewer side of things, you only see our subscriber count update every now and again. Like, for my channel uh, and my size, I believe it only updates when I get a thousand new subscribers. Which uh, takes a while, obviously. On the creator side of things, I can see literally every single subscriber down to the final point, essentially. If if someone joins, I see it. If someone leaves, I see it, like, in real time. That is a really devastating thing. And especially when you do start to do it as a career, when it does become something you start, you want to rely on for income, for whatever and you have a video underperform, uh, or you only release one video a month, and one month that video just doesn't do as well as it usually does, it can be devastating for financials, for your mental health. It is a really uncertain profession. So I would definitely say, in terms of the professional side, try to start off as a hobby YouTuber and be... And try to see what it is if it becomes a profession. Don't come into it thinking, I'm going to upload a couple of videos. I'm going to become the next big thing. And it's going to be awesome. Like, 
try to brace yourself for it by seeing it as an extra thing you're doing and not a, a an attempted career until it becomes big enough so you can consider that. I can confirm pretty much everything that you said. And if somebody has this attitude or mindset, I'm going to upload a few videos and I'm going to blow up. Right now I'm sitting at close to 12,000 subscribers and I have like 100 videos. Like 30 of them are maybe shorts, but we're speaking about like 70 to 80 videos long form. Like that's a lot. And I'm still at like 12,000 subscribers, so it's not going to happen overnight. Oh yeah, no doubt. It takes a while. Um, I believe for my first... Um, I forget where I can see it, but let me just pull up some statistics for you. It took uh, me like... Uh, in the first month, I was very lucky. I got to 1,000 subscribers. I think it took me uh, like six months to reach the next milestone. No, even more. It took me... A yeah, no, it was six. It took me six months to reach the 5,000 milestone. Like, it can be very slow, especially at the start. You shouldn't expect to blow up. I had released uh, probably similar a similar amount of videos to you at that point, uh, and I was only at 5,000 subscribers. Don't expect to blow up. You're only putting mental strain on yourself and your channel, which you really shouldn't want. Uh, I can get behind all of this. And there is also this story of exponential growth. Because basically, right now, possible history, maybe a week is doing what his past self was doing in a month or two months or quarter of a year or anything. So like, don't underestimate this. It's like... Also, regarding the risk of YouTube, you didn't mention the YouTube algorithm because what if it decides like history? Nah, that's too violent. Yeah, How yeah. about we just remove that? I think rewriting history and I, we both had the same experience. Uh, uh, what was it? He week and a half ago, where there was a oh, bug yeah. in the YouTube um, on YouTube's end, which made it appear as if we we'd suddenly gone down from like. Uh, in my case, I think it was 2,000 views every single hour. Suddenly, I was down to 350. And I saw that, and my heart just stopped, you know? Because I hoped it was a bug, and after getting into contact with some other creators, I was pretty sure it was a bug. But on the other hand, it is very possible that one day, or one week, or one month, the algorithm just decides, I don't like your channel anymore. And... You don't get banned, you don't get removed from the platform, that, that is also possible, but usually uh, it takes a bit to get, to get there. But the algorithm can just simply decide, your content is not doing good enough anymore, we're not going to promote you anymore, and they just silently kill your channel. And the fear of that is something that I still struggle with every single day. I'm doing very well, uh, but every day I'm like, oh, but what if... But what if tomorrow I don't, you know? Make a video. Make a video. No, I mean, like, make a video, like, what if the YouTube algorithm shut me off tomorrow? Yeah. Like a historical what if, because we're doing alternate history. Like, it's going to be very ironical. What about, what has changed in the past two years of you doing YouTube? Because two years ago, we were just a, I don't know, regular dude. Right now, you're still a regular dude, but with 110,000 subscribers. Now, now I'm, I'm a big shot. I mean, uh, Mr. <laughs> Possible History. Um, do you mean like for myself personally or in terms of YouTube? Um, I mostly want the personal side, but I would also love to hear the YouTube side. I mostly want to hear like, I don't know, what does your family think? What does your friends think? What's like the personal side? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, basically what has changed is everything. Like I used to be, uh, I'm, I'm, I've never been uh, someone who was good at school or concentrating or whatever. Um, and most of my free time was spent uh, video gaming, hanging with friends, whatever. Uh, not really doing anything productive. Not, not that that is an issue, uh, especially if you're young, 
feel free to enjoy your free time. Don't feel pressured to start a career, uh, to monetize your hobbies. Definitely don't do all of those things. But that was basically my mindset at the time. And now most of my time is going into my YouTube. I've basically stopped gaming altogether. Um, I've become way more, I wouldn't say serious, but mature. Uh, I used to be a student two years ago. I'm still a student now, but I'm not really doing as much anymore. Uh, basically, everything changed. Um, in terms of my family, um, they don't really understand what I'm doing. None of them is really into <laughs> history. And the ones that are, are too old to get my content, basically. Uh, they're not really interested. Um, so I remember when my first big paycheck came in from YouTube and I was like, okay, maybe I can do this as a career. My uncle and grandmother were like, okay, this is awesome at a party, you know? And my grandfather just sat there and he crossed his arms. He looked at me a little bit angrily and he said, uh, yeah, but you still don't have a degree. So, and that was all he had to add on the subject. And I was like, okay, th thank you, granddad. Um, I know that my older brother, um, doesn't support my YouTube career. Uh, and while he doesn't say it to me personally, he says it to like our joint friend groups and my family where he's like, oh yeah, he's just making stupid videos. He has a bit of luck now, but it's going to run out and it's going to be nothing again. And I'm, I'm just like, okay, man, uh, thanks. Love the support there. It sounds like jealousy to me. Sounds like what? Jealousy. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, probably, but uh, it's, it's really something in terms of my family that I've gone through alone. Uh, I do try to keep them updated somewhat, like when I got 100,000 subscribers and I got the play button, they all thought it was awesome. But beyond them being like, good for you, there's basically, they, they don't care. Um, my friends, my history friends care a little bit. My normal friends only like the fact that I am popular, but they don't really care about my channel in general. Like a common joke right now is uh, whenever someone slides me in a minor way, they ironically go, do you know who this is? This is possible f history, you know? Uh, as a joke, obviously, within our own friend group, which is rather funny. But beyond that... Uh... <laughs> No one in my personal life cares. <laughs> I mean, you can flip this going back because people have this fear of them starting YouTube and nobody liking it and them being exposed on national television, how much their content sucks. But you can see that even a guy like Possible History at 150,000 subscribers, like nobody cares, even his friends, like... Which, I mean, you can use it as a good thing when you're starting, because nobody would care if you fail, right? I'm just trying to true. make the best of the situation. <laughs> and that, that, that is very true. For me personally, uh, I tell my grandparents that I'm a video editor because they can grasp it easier. Yeah, fair. I'm like, what, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I'm still working for a, another company. No, I'm not self-employed. This is like uh, only rich people do that. I'm not. And I'm like, yeah, I, I work in a company. Thank God they haven't asked me the name or anything since I have to lie on the spot. Yeah. Which I think is quite interesting. But for me, like with my friends, again, nobody cares. I mean, like, of course they are supportive. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I cannot go out. I'm making videos. And I'm like, ah, sure. Which is great. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 on, the most, on the whole, they're definitely supportive. Uh, but don't expect like your personal life to be impacted too much and people to recognize you off the streets and your friends to be like, whoa, what a big shot. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I expect there is a certain, uh, especially because like for the most part, we don't come on camera, uh, on our main videos. There really is no, uh, fame connected to the job for me. Unless somebody recognizes your voice in the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, but like, 
recognizing a voice is difficult, man. Like especially in a different system. language. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that's true. Like I'm Dutch, so if I'm talking in a grocery store, I would speak in Dutch. Like I go to college still, and there are all are all these history students there, which technically should be my target audience. Uh, nobody has recognized me, of course. Obviously, nobody has gone like, "Hey, I, I recognize that voice. Are you the possible history?" Nah, I can actually one up you on that. I, I'm just like I'm. I'm that meme, you know, where I'm, I'm standing in the corner, everyone is partying, and I'm just like, they don't. Know. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, let me tell you a story. I think that you will find it quite funny. I can one up you on that. Since my university, the technical university of Varna, which I quit, I think six, six months ago, about something like that. Basically, I decided to drop out of university one and a half years in because I was like, okay, a university either gives you knowledge or it helps you get a job. And for my situation, I studied programming in school for five years. I worked it for two. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to get the knowledge. But I already have like two or two years behind my back, which I think is more, I don't know, appealing rather than just a degree. So I was like, okay, I'm not getting anything that college has to offer and I can focus on YouTube. So fuck that. I'm not boring it out. So before I quit, <laughs> I was like, what are you blurring out? But I, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Basically in one of my, no, actually I have two people that were from the exact same university like in Varna in my home city one was in my discord very like active member and he just I remember because I don't know that he knew I was from Varna he just knew that I was Bulgarian and he just took a random picture of the campus and I was like oh yeah I'm pretty sure I know where this is do you want me to tell you and he was like yeah and I'm like this is the playground up of the technical university of Varna and this guy just didn't know what to respond because I was put on and yeah, basically I had one person in my Discord server who studied in the exact same university as I did. And one time I was live streaming Hearts Fire and playing Bulgaria in Millennium Dawn. So you can assume that 50% of my audience was Bulgarian. And I even did a poll to like, basically I was like, okay, if 50% like the majority is Bulgarian, I'll just switch language. It, it failed. But there was also one guy that studied in the same university. And the same, uh, what was it called? It... I don't want to call it professional or degree, but the same course curriculum with me. So I can one up you on that. Uh, actually, uh, I do realize now, um, I have been recognized one time as possible history, not directly, but uh, it was a friend of mine, or at least uh, someone I knew from uh, university. Uh, we have like a campus cafe, so we went there, I sat down with a couple of my friends, he joined, we started talking a bit, and at some point, the subject of what I was doing came up. So I was like, yeah, I, I just made this video uh, about like the Harry Potter world map, you know? Uh, it was uh, a, a rather big hit at the time, it's one of my most watched videos, uh, where I like criticized the map of wizarding schools in Harry Potter. Uh, and the guy sits next to me, he looks at me, he pulls out his phone, and he shows me my video, and he says, I was literally just watching that. And I was like, oh, holy shit. But, uh, Spoil that him is, painting. <laughs> that, that is... <laughs> that was basically the only, uh, only time I came close to getting recognized, or at least met someone in real life who... Uh, oh no, actually, it happened recently as well. Like, within my friend group, there is one guy who was almost never there. So, we were all hanging out, he came in, and we were chatting, and we were chatting, and at some point someone make, makes the joke like, oh, do you know who this is? This is possible fucking history, you know? Uh, and we were all laughing, and the guy looks at me, and he says, are you really? And I was like, what do you mean? Are you really possible history? I'm like, yeah. What the hell, dude? I watch you all the time! And that, that was... Pretty funny to uh, experience. If it happened recently, then he's not a big fan because he hasn't seen the face reveal in the second is, channel. Is, but to be fair, uh, the face reveal, uh, so far, uh, the channel is growing, but I, I, I don't think more than like 
5,000 people in the world would be able to recognize me in a crowd right now uh, from that channel. If I may ask you about your upload schedule, not necessarily about schedule, but your work on your videos, and it's especially regarding the topic of motivation, because the number one excuse I would say if somebody were in our position is like, okay, I don't have motivation, so I'm never going to do it. Yeah. But both of us have a very consistent upload schedule. So yeah, how consistent? I would just call well, yours a lot, but fair. Uh, yeah, mine is existing. <laughs> Basically, how do you keep it up for two years? Uh, I think the most important thing for me was to like set a date that I want to release a video, because at that point, I am I'm completely free to just not upload anything. Uh, and while it would hurt my channel a bit, I, I don't think it would kill it. So it's not that I'm forced to do a video a week. Many people get away with a lot less. But it is just for me to be like, okay, now I have this deadline. And I told you before, I'm not diagnosed with ADHD or anything like that. Uh, I don't want to claim that I have it. But in terms of the concentration aspects, I do identify with what they have. I am basically unable to get any work done if there is a chance that I can do it later, basically. Um, so setting myself that deadline for me was just incredibly important because I could be like, okay, I don't want to finish this video, but I have to because I have to release this video on Friday at three o'clock every single day. And so last week I didn't have my video done again because I'm a procrastinator. So the day before I had like this prom with my, on my uni, it was one and a half hours away by train. I woke up, I took the train back to my uh, home city, came home and I finished the video at two, at Friday, two o'clock, released it at three, you know? Uh, and that, that kind of forcing part of it is for me personally, very important on why I have uh, a consistent schedule. I actually really like this because I don't have these problems. I have completely different solution to this, which means that if you're a viewer listening to this or watching or whatever you're doing, basically you should get an answer to this problem, struggling with motivation, because we would hear two different responses to that. Mine is, I know that I'm not motivated, but I do it anyways. I don't want to rely on motivation and I don't think that anybody should because you're like, what, motivated 10 days in a year. Does it mean that you work on your YouTube channel just 10 days in a year? Yeah, and but, you need... Guess, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah? but when you do have one of those days where you wake up and you're just on, you know, and you work on your channel and it's awesome and everything you do just works and flows those 10 days are awesome it's it's the best feeling to me i love it like so i can confirm but the problem is that they don't happen back to back so yeah i mean that's how i wrote a book in four days i just had a very nice couple of days like i was writing up to ten thousand words a day which it's a lot i would argue it's like creative writing it's not like gibberish so basically, I just was like, okay, fuck motivation. I, I don't need it. I'll do it anyways. And I also started rewarding myself. I am a cigar smoker, a proud one and that. <laughs> you popped so I was, <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, okay, depending on how this successful video is, this is the price I'm going to spend on a cigar. And I don't have a spreadsheet yet, but maybe I should create a spreadsheet about like a range of views. Like, Sub 10,000, I get like that four euro cigar. And if it's like 100,000 plus, I get like 20 euro cigar or whatever. So basically, rewarding yourself also feels good because yeah. I reward myself with cigar, I reward myself with growth and everything. But what I'm doing is quite dangerous. And I think that the person should protect their passion because and if I protect your lungs from. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't inhale cigar smoke, but that's like entirely diff different topic. 
And what was I saying? Yeah, protecting your passion. Basically, you need to protect your passion because the problem is, is if you work despite motivation, and right now if I don't protect my passion and I'm like, okay, I'm no longer passionate about YouTube, I'm going to quit. The thing is that I'm going to quit before I reach possible history levels. When I would argue that you do less work and you get more reward. Like, of course, you can disagree with me, but you know that before you were putting more work than now. I mean, in videos, for example, like, I don't mean to discredit you or anything. You're obviously doing live streams, you're updating your maps, you're doing a lot. But, but you can agree that, like, time to reward ratio right now has oh, been the best. It definitely improved. Uh, I, I would say I'm still spending a similar amount of time on my channel. But like you say, time to reward, of course, it, it gets it gets way better because I have a limit in the amount of time I even can spend, you know? So uh, I couldn't put in more work if I wanted to, basically. Uh, and that has been the case in the past as well. So obviously, the more you get out of that, the bigger your channel is, the better it is for uh, time to reward ratios. Exactly. So just watch out not to burn out and quit before you reach the most rewarding times. Another very important trick, not just for YouTube, but for your life in general, is positive procrastination. Uh, do you know what this is? I have heard of productive procrastination, but yeah, positive I, I, procrastination... I, I think it, it, it's basically the same thing. Uh, okay. It's when I've done a script, uh, I need to do the visuals, and after I've done the visuals, I need to do uh, putting it together and recording. When I don't feel like recording and putting a video together, I can work on another video's uh, visuals. When I don't feel like doing that, I can work on another video script. At any given time, I'm working on probably like 15 different videos. Uh, some are just very short snippets. Some are just a map I thought of, like, okay, maybe this would be perfect Iraq. Uh, some of them are full scripts, which I just never finished. But when I don't feel like doing one thing for the channel, I have so many other things that I can do which I might feel more inclined towards at this point. And that is a very important thing to keep you more uh, motivated. And the thing is that it's different from productive procrastination. Productive procrastination means you're doing a video, but you cannot continue for whatever reason. So you boot up YouTube and you watch a video on how to improve your script writing or anything. Basically, you say, okay, I want to learn instead of do something. And the problem becomes when you just end up consuming all of this content and doing nothing. Yeah, fair. Well, think possible history. We have hit the one hour mark. We still have some questions left over and it's up for the audience. If they like the video and they want us to continue, what I wanted to discuss with you is the possibility of World War III, your take, are you hiding in Switzerland? And also I wanted to discuss the European Union with you since I'm Bulgarian. Uh, and Bulgaria is always on the bottom of every EU chart and you're Dutch, which is fortunate. <laughs> Let's say that. <laughs> and we can discuss these questions. I also would like to touch on Europe versus America debate, which I think is going to be quite interesting. Maybe we get Videntis like an American in here. So for sure we have a lot more questions that are left unanswered. So it's up to the audience if they want us to continue. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the content, subscribe to uh, Rewriting History's channel. Uh, I hope to see you in the next one. Uh, a lot of collaborations with Rewriting History are coming up. So you're going to be hopefully hearing a lot more of us in the coming weeks, months, etc. Et Cheers, everyone. Goodbye.